I'm very glad to introduce uh, our keynote speaker of today, Mr. Eric Newton. I've seen him on YouTube, and I've uh, heard already that he's a very interesting, fascinating speaker, has many things to say, especially about what the skills should be for modern journalists, and that's what we all would like to know. Mr. Newton has been a journalist himself, amongst others at the, the Oakland Tribune as a managing editor. He has founded a museum about news, the Newseum in uh, Washington. And now already for many years, he is the senior advisor of the Knight Foundation. And that's one of the biggest, if not the biggest journalism foundations uh, worldwide, actually. Please, Mr. Newton, go ahead. Thank you. I'd like to thank the, um, the Netherlands uh, uh, Press Fund for your kind invitation to uh, speak here today at the, the journalist in training. Um, but even more than that, I'd like to thank Jack and, and Jim Knight, who were two American newspaper owners in the 20th century who decided to donate their personal fortunes to create the Knight Foundation, uh, which now has uh, $2.3 billion and gives away about $100 million a year, 30 to 50 million of that in journalism. Without the Knight brothers, I wouldn't be here. Keynote, the word, uh, means the single note upon which a key or system of notes is founded. So I'll do my best to hit that note, but whether anybody wants to sing along is, that's another matter. Now this talk is about the teaching hospital model of journalism education. In discussing it, I want to be radically clear about three things. The first is that there is, in my opinion, no fully formed teaching hospital for journalism education in existence today in the world. I believe it is an aspiration. The second is that working together, students and professionals and professors can build the ultimate teaching hospital for journalism. And the third is if it is built out I think this model will help lead journalism to a better future in the 20th century, or in the 21st century. I, I, uh, I hope after today, uh, you'll consider moving uh, journalism education in the Netherlands in, and in Europe in, in, in this, further in this direction. The teaching hospital uh, for journalism education rests upon an ancient idea that people learn by doing. There's a quote often attributed to Ben Franklin uh, in the United States. On, it's, it's on all the quotation websites. You can look it up. And it says, tell me and I forget. Teach me and I remember. Involve me and I learn. Of course, the only problem with that is Ben Franklin may have never said it. Uh, no original can be found. Uh, but when you do your homework, when you learn by doing, you can discover that this idea is not 200 years old, but 2,000 years old. There was a Confucian philosopher, uh, uh, Zunzi, uh, who seems to have written it down first. It's a Chinese proverb, and it's commonly translated thusly. I hear and forget. I see and I remember. I do and I understand. Education, which might be defined as knowing the difference between Ben Franklin and Zunzi, uh, thrives through learning by doing. As the United States was moving from an agricultural nation to an industrial one, it created dozens of land-grant universities these colleges were designed to do specific practical education in science, engineering, especially agriculture. Uh, these land-grant universities in the, in the century since have helped American farmers improve their uh, methods 
uh, Department of Agriculture study said for every dollar that was invested, the public got $10 in benefit from the agricultural work. New seeds, new plants, new fa uh, farming, and food processing um, all was developed through the universities, through those land-grant agricultural uh, uh, programs. Now, in the United States, um, over time, 800 law clinics have been spawned by law schools. Professors and students handle uh, some very difficult cases. Many times, students handle cases alone, even arguing in court. A dozen of the legal clinics specialize in Supreme Court cases. They've been involved in some of the most important uh, victories that we've had. Now, law schools believe that learning by doing helps students master skills faster. The clinics motivate and invigorate them. Ethics becomes easier to teach because abstractions become real. And it's not just limited to the law. In the arts, students at more than 600 college-level music programs routinely perform live in real-world symphonies and um, jazz uh, ensembles and all other kinds of, of, uh, of uh, performances for real audiences. And we have students sitting in with some of our very best uh, symphonies. The field of education learns by doing. In 2011, a graduate school called Relay made headlines in the United States. Um, Philanthropy Magazine called it the first graduate school of education in more than 80 years to win credentials in New York State. In order to get a master's degree from Relay, you have to prove that your students are learning. If you can't teach, you can't graduate. You have to measure student performance in your classes. In other fields, science students work on real experiments with their professors. Sports students participate in actual sports. Computer science students program real computers, but of all the fields, medicine and its, its concomitant, the teaching hospital, holds, in, in my opinion, the most promise uh, for journalism education. Because like many news organizations, the teaching hospital is deeply rooted in community. In these hospitals, medical students, under the tutelage of actual doctors, learn how to draw blood, how to insert catheters, how to set broken arms, uh, even deliver babies. Uh, why? Because book learning and passing tests are just not enough to teach you how to be a doctor. Add experience, and you've got it. How many of you would like to go to the doctor's office and uh, only to have your young physician say to you, well, gee, I read about it in the textbook, but I've never actually inserted a catheter before. So bear with me, you know, uh, not something we'd, we'd like to do. In the United States, there are about 400 teaching hospitals. They develop new cures and treatments. They set high standards for patient care and they treat the most difficult cases while serving the poor. At the same time, they train more than 100,000 new doctors and other health professionals every year. So if giving physicians real world experience is part of their education, of course, um, of course it should apply to journalism. Young journalists need to employ objective techniques to collect facts, they need to use the latest equipment, they need to learn how to communicate clearly, they need to understand that journalism is not about them, it's about the community. And com these are communities that need um, news uh, for its social health as much as they need uh, physical health. News and information are the lifeblood of uh, communities and community journalism, good journalism, is as important to a, to a city as uh, clean water and fresh air. But at this point, as I'm saying, no journalism education program mirrors exactly an actual teaching hospital. 
Uh, in my country, that may be a controversial statement because we have, we have deans and directors who raise money by extolling the virtues of their programs. And that's hard work under difficult circumstances. Many people, including more than a few university presidents, don't appreciate journalism. Journalists have this irritating habit of telling everyone uncomfortable truths all the time. And so it's an uphill battle um, with funders, the likes of me, saying universities should care more about the future. And news companies of today, not as willing as they've been to fund journalism education in the present. There is some good news. American foundations are not only investing more in media at triple the growth rate of their other grant making, but we're also investing more in journalism education. The teaching hospital model is helping with that. But, but if schools don't do actual journalism, it heightens the criticisms of those who argue that foundations should pour their money directly into critical areas like investigative reporting. So you might hear after this talk something from the University of Missouri saying, we are uh, a teaching hospital. And as much as I admire them, they've been doing this for a century, I'd say it's not exactly right. So let's unpack the workings of what these hospitals actually do. They cure people in the present, but they develop new cures for the future. And they focus on community. A study by the American Hospital Association calls teaching hospitals centers of innovation. They're credited with pioneering polio vaccines, infant intensive care, burn treatments, heart transplant protocols. The survival rates of seriously ill patients in teaching hospitals is higher in the United States than in other hospitals. Their level of overall patient care is significantly higher than at non-teaching hospitals. They offer many community services other hospitals do not. They have health fairs, support groups, information centers. Though they make up only 6% of our hospitals, they take care of 50% of, of treatment for those who can't pay uh, or are on Medicaid. Even in Europe, you see proliferations of, of teaching uh, hospitals that number in the many hundreds. Uh, you have two here in Amsterdam. So to duplicate a teaching hospital, a university-based community news organization will need to combine in one effort six different elements. Students doing the journalism, professionals mentoring them to improve the quality and impact of the journalism, professors bringing in topic knowledge and teaching the complex issues, innovators pioneering new tools and techniques, academics doing major research projects, all in uh, with an emphasis not on just informing a community but engaging with the community, that's the sixth element. In Searchlights and Sunglasses, uh, Field Notes from the Digital Age of Journalism, it's an ebook that we've just released, I offer the following definition of the teaching hospital model. A model of learning by doing that includes college students, professors, and professionals working together under one digital roof for the benefit of a community. Experiments of any size that contain the six elements of an actual teaching hospital will move journalism education forward because they'll give you real world experience, the latest tools and techniques, teaching teams to collaborate, and uh, having experimentation and uh, continuous improvement and helping communities. Doing all these things at the same time Time helps everyone. It speeds the reform of journalism education and it helps the field of journalism. The Knight Foundation has invested about $200 million in journalism education during the past 15 years. 
So we know a little bit about the programs in the United States. And we're not aware of anyone that has all of these elements. And it's, that's not a criticism. Uh, many of the schools do part of, parts of the teaching hospital extremely well. And they get benefits from doing those parts well. Now, I've taken the different kinds of things that happen in journalism education and, and created three categories to try to uh, show you how the, the pieces of the teaching hospital are already in existence. So let's call the first category first aid. Okay, first aid is in the moment. It's a do-it-yourself thing. In the journalism context, first aid is all about stories. Uh, it's about students producing content, which they do quite naturally in social and mobile media, whether there are professors around or not. In a university context, uh, students might cover the neighborhoods around a university as part of a class or file blog posts or Wikipedia entries as class assignments, or blog or tweet or tumble uh, on their own. Uh, first aid goes on everywhere all the time. Uh, there are educational benefits of it, uh, even if professors are not involved. By putting yourself out there, uh, you can learn clear expression, how to do things fast, uh, what happens when you get some feedback. So educators should be commended for doing open assignments. In other words, uh, and rather than have the class do papers, for them to have the class posting assignments online. And those who experiment with the flipped class should get a, a commendation. Uh, uh, flipped classes basically switch homework and classwork, offering the video lectures at night online and using the class time to do real projects that are put out for public consumption in any medium. So we should admit, though, that first aid, uh, just like in the medical world, sometimes has great results and sometimes doesn't. The students who told each other about the, the shooting that was going on lot, as it was happening at Virginia Tech um, they shared the news through social media long before traditional media showed up. They were practicing first aid and they were saving lives. But that doesn't happen every time. As with actual first aid, the responsibilities of the responder rarely extend beyond the initial moment of engagement. But the fact that anyone can act journalistically in mass media context today is one of the defining characteristics of the new digital age and we can't turn our back on it. The second category I would, I would call clinics. Many students have, uh, many schools have excellent clinics, but unlike law schools, they don't call them that. A key element at a clinic is the involvement of a person with serious quality professional experience. Now, the result of that kind of mentoring is journalism that can have a real impact, journalism that matters. There are many different forms of clinics. Some last a week, some a quarter or a semester, some go on all year. Uh, clinics can focus on a single story, a series of stories, a topic or a community, uh, student media in which the students have reached a professional level can also be thought of as, as clinics. Almost any university uh, can have a clinic like the one um, at Northeastern uh, run by Walter Robinson. Uh, Walter was the investigative editor of the Boston Globe and now he teaches a class in investigative reporting. He works closely with his class every semester on an investigation. Their stories end up on the front page of the Boston Globe and have an impact on the community. Now, why does this work? Because Walter Robinson is Walter Robinson. He's an excellent investigative editor, a master at verifying and clarifying. He has the trust of the Boston Globe. Uh, he won't offer them 
substandard work, just like when he worked there. So to do this kind of class-based clinic, you don't need additional funding. You don't need uh, a foundation to help you do it. All you need is your own Walter Robinson. The educational value of it is immense. Uh, complexity becomes manageable and students get more than their money's worth. Now one of the biggest clinics we have is called News 21. At Arizona State University, students from all over the United States spend a summer doing a major investigation. And again, there are top professionals involved, including Len Downey, the former uh, editor of the Washington Post. The students that are selected for this program, like an all-star team of college journalists in the United States, get a special semester of training in the topic that they'll be investigating that coming summer in their 10-week uh, uh, fellowship. And this helps them develop the subject expertise uh, in things like uh, you know, voting rights, veterans' rights, and the other topics that they cover. Uh, we used to call that specialty reporting, and now the scholars at Harvard have started calling it knowledge journalism. Whatever you want to call it, it helps to know something about what you're reporting. Now, some clinics publish their own stories, um, like the New York World at Columbia University or Neon Tommy at USC, which has 7 million, um, 7 million uh, page views per year. It's one of the most uh, popular uh, student journalism uh, projects. Small schools say they can't do this kind of thing. But remember Walter Robinson. If a clinic is integrated totally into the educational environment, um, in, you could at each and every journalism school have clinics at a cost of precisely zero. You already pay the teachers, the students who are already there doing assignments. All you need to do is reorganize things. So nothing new is required. What the clinics have in common is the publication of real journalism and strong professionals. Instead of delivering babies, we're going to deliver stories. Um, and in my opinion, uh, clinics are an essential part of journalism education, especially uh, clinics that teach digital skills. Uh, they're prized assets at the schools that do them, uh, just as uh, just as good uh, law clinics are prized assets at law schools and symphonies at musical uh, music schools and, and just as uh, teaching hospitals are prized by communities. These clinics provide tens of thousands of stories in American communities that are no longer provided by traditional media, which because we're so heavily dependent on the advertising model in the United States, our traditional newspaper journalism is in free fall. The universities with strong uh, clinics are providing a real service to those communities. And because the clinics focus more on the techniques of today, they, they are helping communities right now. The working journalists in our country admire clinics. At the University of Alabama, we have a master's degree that's taught 50% in the classroom and 50% in the newsroom of a newspaper called the Aniston Star. Uh, this program supports itself through a tuition surcharge. Uh, why are the students willing to pay more? It has a placement rate of 90%. And in fact, clinic work makes students employable at rates that far exceed our national average. The third category I would call labs. Now labs experiment. They're not as interested in what's going on in journalism at the moment as they are in what's going to be needed tomorrow. They develop new software, new applications, new systems, new story forms. They fail a lot because they try a lot of very new things. They're more aligned toward the way the millennial generation thinks. A lab doesn't even have to be a physical place. It can be a mindset. It's the sort of thing that caused, um, the sort of thinking that caused uh, uh, 
a young uh, graduate named David Cohn in the United States to create Spot.us, which was a platform that allows people to crowdfund stories, fund the reporters for individual stories, and thereby community in influences what is, what is covered. That thinking is the kind of thinking that led to millennials at a, at a project called Policy Mike to, to, to flip the idea of when stories uh, should be put out into the community. When I was a, an editor back in the Stone Age, before the World Wide Web, uh, we published stories when, as soon as we could, and whenever they were ready, and hopefully that was at the same time. But at Policy Mike, they use behavioral analytics to mine social media, look at the conversations that are going on, and put stories out when the community is ready to talk about it, not when the journalists are ready. This is a fundamentally different uh, way of doing it. They don't do every single thing that way, but they, it's like having a member of the community sitting at the news meeting. It's a different way of thinking about it, and it works the website went from zero to eight million uniques in 18 months. And many millennials are writing and reading uh, uh, some of our most uh, complex stories on our most difficult issues, which of course their elders thought they didn't care about. So these labs are not as common as the clinics, but they do exist in the United States. At Reese News Lab at the University of North Carolina, the students there call their work crazy, innovative, a hobbit hole, and they call the place where you just do things, where you can experiment, and where you can do anything. They cr consider the creative destruction of our current news systems to be a challenge. Journalism will not get better, say the students at, at Reese News, until we stop reliving the past. And the projects that they do can be very practical, like a word searchable archive of the State Assembly or uh, of the audio library of the State Assembly or uh, a commercial ebook uh, helping students optimize content for mobile devices. We have other major labs at places like the Center for Civic Media at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Uh, MIT defines uh, um, civic media as anything that strengthens the, strengthens the social bonds within a community or creates a strong sense of civic engagement among its residents. So their work encompasses not just traditional journalism but uh, media work as well. And at MIT in the Media Lab, engineering and comu uh, computer science students uh, every day are creating the technologies all of us will be using tomorrow. The Knight Lab at Northwestern University has produced dozens of prototypes as part of its lab work, including the popular timeline JS which is an open source tool that enables visually rich timelines and it's used widely by news organizations and it's in 40 languages. That's what you want to see, is a lab with journalism and computer science students at a university developing a new tool or technology that then is in wide use in the journalism profession, just in the way that burn treatment um, would go from a teaching hospital to all physicians in a country. Now, like clinics, labs are essential to journalism education. It's not a question of we can't do one without the other. We have to do both. We must care about the future of news and information. Labs do that. We simply can't proceed as though the current news system will survive beyond the lives of the people who support it now, because it won't. An entirely new set of people, digital natives, the people who will be alive when I'm no longer alive, they'll be doing the journalism. They've grown up with new forms of media, social and modal, mobile media that have grown up with them. 
and they'll dominate it and shape its future. Already in the United States, a majority of the newspapers get their traffic from mobile media. And the journalists who can learn code, who can learn data, who can learn the latest technology, will be able to crawl inside of it and ride it into the future. And they will help us produce the algorithms, uh, the applications, and the software that will carry journalism values through the rest of this century. The educational value of these labs is manifold. And as I said, the labs don't have to be big, well-funded physical spaces. They can be a mindset. When uh, San Diego State Professor Amy Schmitz-Weiss uh, showed that news organizations in the United States were not using geolocation as part of their mobile applications, like everybody else was, she was acting as a one-woman lab, you know, testing something, publishing her research. And with the clinics, um, you know, where there's more activity than we can track, um, the labs, too, are starting to overproduce our capacity to absorb what they're doing. So we have groups like Neiman Lab or Journalist Research or PBS Media Shift or the Pointer Institute constantly pouring out the developments from these labs. So if you want a teaching hospital, what you need to do is put these three things together. Uh, you need first aid, you need an emergency room, you need clinics, you need labs, all in the same uh, place. Um, but even when you do that, you haven't totally arrived. Um, it, teaching hospital means working with other parts of the university. It means you testing not just story forms, but also business uh, models. It means um, looking for new revenue streams, like the spot.us uh, idea, and even testing cost-cutting measures like getting rid of printed books and using that money to buy better devices. Um, since uh, in, in this aspirational approach, um, the, uh, the teaching hospitals would be doing something very different than what's going on now, and I think they can lay claim, even in the United States, to federal uh, grant money. Uh, for, the, for the technology and for the experimentation that they're uh, doing. We have the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, which funds um, you know, some of our traditional public broadcasting in the United States, and I think that we should, we should argue that they should be funding the journalism education when it involves actual journalism. So the challenge is combining the journalism expertise with the technological expertise and combining the entrepreneurial spirit and the community service. And our goal should be with the teaching hospital to provide better news than the commercial news stream does and provide greater community engagement and service. And to test somewhere in the hospital with our innovators and our real community uh, new tools and techniques. The teaching hospital model can be the engine of change for journalism education. And no longer will we be the caboose driven around by the industry. I think that uh, I think the professionals and professors can work together when they really want to. Journalism education can uh, meet the challenge that some of our most knowledgeable educators have uh, talked about in a recent report called Educating Journalists, which was released at Columbia University. Now, it called for um, both advancing skills and applied research at the graduate level in schools of journalism. It's the research that is, is the coin of the realm at universities. And proliferating applied research as part of the teaching hospital would be a key to its acceptance in the rest of the university. 
all kinds of, uh, of uh, sort of near universities, uh, uh, near, near hospitals exist, and a little uh, school called Mercer in Macon, Georgia, a commercial uh, newsroom, a public broadcasting unit, and students and faculty share the same physical newsroom and, and work together. They do special community engagement projects, but they're not quite there. They don't really have a big research component. We're, we're hoping that um, the folks who have almost all the elements will look around and see what they don't have and, and add it so that they can kick their work up a notch. Now, one thing to think about is that the soul of the teaching hospital, the energy that drives it, is student energy. Digital natives who want to tell stories are the greatest asset a journalism school has and will ever have, an asset that some media uh, companies would, would kill for. Um, digital natives who want to tell stories. If you can figure out uh, how to unleash that energy, um, you've really got something. Louisiana State University is trying that. They're going to have a special competition. The dean is going to look for student-led projects that use social and mobile media for news experiments. And we're going to see what kinds of things uh, come out of that. Social media is becoming a fountain for breaking news. And, uh, and the doorway through which a generation is consuming traditional news. You know, asking digital natives for help is the right thing to do. A professor who has all the answers to news and information today in the year 2013, in the middle of the biggest transition in communication history, is a professor who can't possibly be right. No one has all the answers. We all are in a search for answers. It's the first time in media history in the United States, the people who run the largest media organizations in the country say they don't know. You know, in five years, will the New York Times be in print? The publisher says, I don't know. So the right answer <laughs> to what are things going to be in the future is, I don't know. What do you think? And the question should be posed at someone from the millennial generation. So how do you know that you're getting there with a teaching hospital model? The better your, your school is at creating a culture of continuous change, the closer you are, uh, the better you can co connect your clinics and labs, the closer you are. The, the better you can create empty space in the curriculum, unprogrammed space. Have you ever been to a conference where every single thing was programmed and you didn't have a chance to talk to anyone? You need to get empty space into the curriculum for the thing to be invented that year or the thing to be invented that week or the new thing that's happening because the new developments are coming faster and faster and they're not incremental, they're changing fundamentally how we're doing things. Rather than specialize in print or broadcast, uh, you can develop new ways for students to specialize in journalism and computer science, journalism and entrepreneurism, journalism and business. We need to do some creating of the kind of owner proprietors we had a century ago who invented the new systems we're all so proud of today. Those were not invented by corporations, those were invented by individuals. People who were Renaissance people who could do more than one thing. All this specialization came after, came after the corporatization and capitalization of what these individuals created. And schools today can create those new individuals. Every generation grows up with a new form of media in ascendance. Everyone knows the baby boomers in television. 
the Gen Xers and computers and video games, the millennials and social and mobile media. A culture of continuous change means you're ready for whatever comes next. Who will design the news bots of the future? Who's going to deal with 3D media? Who's going to deal with wearable media, with sensor-driven media, with artificial intelligence, and it's all happening? We can decide we don't want to think about it, but that's not going to stop it. It's going to show up just like all the other generations of media change have shown up. In American history, that's 12 generations. We don't have as much history as you do. That's 12 generations of new forms of media growing up with new generations of Americans. The question for journalism education is, you know, does it want to be involved in its future or does it want to become a history program? So this might sound daunting, uh, but I, I think a university can combine the elements of clinics and labs without building an entire teaching hospital. Last month at the Online News Association in um, America, we announced a million dollar fund to give universities $35,000 micro grants when they could take all those six elements and put them together and do a live news experiment. You know, look at how news is being done now, come up with an idea, a hypothesis, do your new tool and technique and see what happens. See if you're right or wrong and tell everyone. And so we hope to encourage between 15 and 25 uh, projects. And there were four funders involved in that. Now at that same uh, conference, I launched an interactive digital book and teaching tool that explains the long version of all the arguments you're hearing this morning. It's called Searchlights and Sunglasses. And we did it, uh, you, can, you can look it up at searchlightsandsunglasses.org. I have to say that. Um, we did it, it, it has a thousand lessons and links and resources. Uh, we did it as an experiment in the teaching hospital model. I did it on my summer vacation. Undergraduate students, graduate students, and a group of people from the University of Missouri. And we hope you'll find it, we'll hope you look at it and find it uh, helpful. But I'd like to, um, if I still have time, I'd like to close with a short uh, passage uh, from the book. Thinking digitally could, could save us. Yet two decades after the dawn of this new age, too many people, processes, policies, and products are creatures of the past. In a way, this is to be expected. There's nothing more difficult to, to take in hand, more perilous to conduct, or more uncertain in its success than to take the lead in the introduction of a new order of things, wrote the Renaissance philosopher Niccolo Machiavelli. The innovator has for enemies all those who have done well under the old conditions. But every day someone pays the price for journalism's persistent inertia. Once rock solid companies are crumbling, old school students and professionals can't find work, our public policies and professional ethics are based on historical fantasies instead of embracing new realities and new possibilities. That said, not everything is new. The one thing that isn't changing is the why of journalism. Why free people need independent thinkers. People who will engage on behalf of all of us in the fair, accurate, contextual search for truth. Now, we assume the people here already believe that an understanding of current events is essential if free people are to run their lives and their communities. 
But whether you're a student, a teacher, or a citizen, or a journalist, we hope your starting point is that you believe in journalism. The challenge is to find our place as both chronicles and chroniclers and curators of a new world, to add today's digital skills and ideas to the mix and get on with it, uh, because much more is on the way. And if the truth be told, you ain't seen nothing yet. Thank you.